estimates are equivalent to square function estimates, equivalent to infinity, equivalent to low quotient, so if this is good, then all of them are equivalent, but you have to put one of them to go down. And um, basically, there are that up until recently, there have been two approaches, both by integration by parts to this business. Um, it's extremely surprising for me that we managed to find the third one and part sums to here. <laughs> Uh, which is not integration by parts. I'll show you all three at least at some level because I think it's worth seeing once. Um, even though we will be using sort of two out of three and then at the day, and you will see why. But let's go to anyway. Um, so before the uh, square function and potential max estimates came on board, which is sort of the beginning of the the only approach available to the seven and the domain uh, was the so called relic identity. So, the relic identity tells you that, at least for harmonic functions, the tangential derivatives are equivalent to normal derivatives on the boundary in, let's say, L2. So, here um, the space is uh, rather, you know, the back to bone, just so that you see it once. Uh, case of let's say Laplace, huh? so ignore the red since for now, just look at the blue. So the blue is just Laplace in half space, Rn plus n plus. Rn is the boundary. So n derivative is the derivative on Rn, so it's a tangential derivative on the boundary. T derivative is a derivative up, so it's a normal derivative on the boundary. And what relic identity tells you, and it's generalization tells you, Morally speaking, but relic identity literally on the point half space for the Laplace one tells you that tangential and normal derivatives are equivalent on the boundary. And here is the way you prove it. Um, you take, so yeah, generalization would be like this. Oops, sorry. Uh, generalization would be like this, but for now we are just looking at this portion. And for now, we are just looking at the same in blue. Again, ignore the red. So we have no fashion. Um, I don't know why in the world they switched from n plus one to n minus one. You know, two lines down, but ignore that. Either way, this is the boundary. <laughs> so on the boundary, I start with derivatives both in x and t. So the full gradient in x and t, both tangential and normal, full gradient square. Um, I'm going to go to the half space, up to half space, by introducing dt. So this is equal to this simply and idiotically because, you know, I added the integral in the vertical direction, assuming that I have some decay at infinity. Uh, you know, this integrates by fundamental theorem of calculus to integral at zero, which is this, right? Um, so this is that. Um, I'm opening, you know, so now I'm in half space. I'm going to open what this actually means. This is, uh, yeah, it was minus because it's up minus down and my zero was positive. So, uh, so I'm opening dt of uh, square of full derivative of gradient of u. This is 2 dt grad u grad u just by uh, differentiation. And now what I'm doing, I'm integrating by parts. So I'm throwing uh, this derivative on this portion. Um, I do that, I get dtu times the Laplacian. Laplacian is equal to zero because the function is harmonic. And plus, uh, I have a boundary term from integration by parts and it's going to be dtu times actually another dtu in this context because when you are integrating by part gradient the function, you have whatever is here times the normal derivative <laughs> by green formula. And normal derivative in half space is dt derivative. So I have dt left from here, and then have another dt. I'm writing it as d nu, but it's actually dt um, coming from the integration by part. And so all in all, uh, 2 is because you know the square gave you 2. Well, differentiate and all in all, I have two dtu square. And hence, the full gradient in x and t square on the boundary is equal to two gradients, uh, two normal derivatives on the boundary 
This is tangential plus normal. This is just normal, but there are two of them. And so one tangential is equal to one normal. So it's kind of the most beautiful sense. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's super cute because people started doing it in uh, the bowl. And for example, Carlos's book and most of the original sources have the computation on the bowl, which obviously is, you know, honestly to me is a little yeah, because you have to go to radial derivatives and, you know, multiply things like x minus q. And I think this is much cleaner. If you do it in half space, you know, everything is easier. Like on wood, t is there. And uh, you also can much more obviously see how to generalize it. So now let's say that I have a more general operator A, and you're thinking, you know, how much more general can I possibly get? Well, there are two things. You will need symmetry. This is a little bit less pleasant to see, but you can see because I'm actually, you know, doing something very symmetric here. But the bigger issue is that, um, this DT thing is going to mess up with you unless A is still independent. You know, you do the same thing, you start from this or from this diacticity. You introduce DT, but the thing is, you know, you cannot play this game because once in a while DT will fall away and you cannot do anything about it. So this shows you that whatever you do with relic, it has to be independent operator. And it's really, really, I mean, like nobody managed to extend it <laughs> from there unless it is a team dependent operator. So, relic is really born for team dependence. Now, why relic is important in principle? Um, just a few words. I mean, I, I won't be talking about this too much, but one way to see it is that, at least for those who have seen, for those of you who have seen it in life, so there is a so called layer potential representation of solutions. And you can write a solution as a, any solution as a double layer of um, directly trace on the boundary of U on the boundary plus the single layer of normal derivative. This is true for any solution under any circumstances. You don't need any coldness for this. But now, in order to get an estimate on U in terms of either one of the components, because directly for regularity has been able to estimate by U on the boundary. Normal has been able to estimate by normal derivative. Well, guess what? I mean, in one case, you need to get one bit in terms of the other. In the other case, you get you need first in terms of the second one. Well, you, you got the point. I mean, either way, you have from this representation formula and some harmonic analysis argument. So, layer potentials are good just on harmonic analysis principles. You don't need much for this. But these two bits. Are there, you know, all together? And in order to solve Neumann, you need to estimate first by second, and in order to solve directly, you need to estimate second by first, which is why relic is handy because that gives you the balances of the sort of two terms on the boundary. But again, relic is, and, and it's, you know, it's super, it has some super powerful generalizations and complex coefficients. It's actually the so called cutter problem, which people have been. Working on for many years, and then wrote like five panels papers when they solved it. It's a pretty cool thing. But point is, it's very t independent. I mean, there is no generalization for no t independent coefficients. Uh, back to our business. Uh, so, first of all, it actually means, uh, yeah, I have to mention that I did the, the example in half space, but in principle, you can do this in the main as well. Because you can get a change of variables from Richard's domain to RM, which will give you change dependent operator. It depends on the change of variables, what operator you get, but you can get the one which will give you change dependent A, and so you're good. Um, but back to our business. So, first of all, even if the dimension of your boundary is minus one, but you are not a Richard's graph, you are already in pretty bad shape because there is no special direction. You, you can see that, you know, having T, clean T and nothing but T was super important here. The good news in Lecher's domain, you still have T and it's still clean. But in more general settings, you don't have this preferred direction and nothing can help you with that. So you cannot do relic or anything similar 
Again, because you don't have a preferred direction, basically. In more general domains than Lipschitz graph. So definitely not rectifiable, like something like this. And for uh, dimension n minus one, even if you are on a straight line, even if you are on the n minus r d, you again can on the relic because your coefficients depend on t, and that's the only thing which makes you leap. Like remember that this dependence on the distance to the boundary, which is as a matter of fact absolute value of t, is kind of what took you off the ground to start with and fire for dimension. So in dimension n minus one, you cannot do, you know, for n minus for sets with n minus one dimensional boundaries, you cannot do anything more general than which you graph by relic. For less than n minus one dimensional boundaries, you can do nothing by relic. Just nothing. So you would send give ins, but now there is another integration by part. <laughs> uh -huh. Remember the square function on tangential max estimate. So that's the other way to approach it. And this is the way we are going to be approaching. So in principle, it's efficient to be able to control the square function. Um, and once again, I'll start showing you sort of, you know, bare bones computation and half space, and then we'll talk about its generalizations. Not super easy, but let me try this. So, I'm, I'm going right away with A, but think about the plus one if you wish to start with. Oh, no, that's fine. Slide within a slide. We like it. Yeah, that's <laughs> cheating. There are also papers within a slide. Remember, it was for me, so whatever went faster is what I was doing. So. Exactly. Uh, slide within a slide. Okay, so. Um, you start with the square function. Um, it's an eighth norm. So remember, it's this double integral on the cone. It simplifies a little bit when you take it and I do, you know, one of the integrals is a test. But for being a long story short, you have radius square t dx as an uh, eighth integral. By, so this is honestly just the square function in L2 square. By electricity, you get to stick A, if there is an A into that. And uh, this is integral, this is equal to L q squared uh, because it's a solution. Why you have give a grad heating u squared here? So there is uh, the time it hits the first q, which is zero because it's a solution. So think of it this way, it's Laplacian. Laplace of u squared is Laplace of u times u plus u times Laplace of u plus two grad u grad u. And both Laplaces of you die because of the solution, and so you are left with two grad u grad u. Okay, same. So not general. So this is because it's a solution. So u is a solution. You get just L of u square. There is nothing used on the operator here, it's all clean. But now I'm going to do something. So now I'm going to use integration by parts to throw this L on the other side. So I have u squared times, well, L joint, if it's not symmetric, thrown on T. Plus the, um, so there is a term coming with uh, um, u itself, which is uh, zero, but there is this term, I mean, so again, uh, when you take a normal derivative of T, if you think about this, so normal derivative of T has only one component, which is going to be, if you if your A was, if you just had a Laplacian normal derivative of T is of course just one, T of T is one. If you have a more general operator, you will get the last bit of the matrix out of it. But again, if you don't want to think about more general operators, just think of the Laplacian and what's left by integration by parts of this, you have L of T and you also have just one because normal derivative of T is on the boundary, yeah. And so all in all, uh, you left with u squared, and that's bounded, well, if you wish by non tangential max of u squared, but again, in principle, your point in life was to bound square function to bound the solutions of the solution. And that's what got. So this is the sort of bare bone square function integration by parts, so just to see that it works in principle for a flash and half space. Now, what do you need to be able to generalize it? Well, uh, you need this term to be zero. 
if zero is a verbal Laplacian, so Laplacian of T is zero. If zero, if A is T independent, still, um, because give a is zero for, you know, like you know, T independent doesn't mess with you. Um, at least, you know, the, the proper part is divergence three. But um, it also, I mean, the good news are contrary to the previous computation with Rayleigh, you can do slightly more general. And we will do that. So specifically, you can do the case when um, T times the gradient of A squared is cognizant. And this is what Guy was talking about yesterday. This is our most important case. And we will see what this goes. So this is somehow, again, this carless and matter is sort of recurrent same. Everything is carless on this slide. You know, solutions are carless on domains, are carless on the sense of being close to planes in the carless on sense. And the coefficients have to be carless on, again, in the sense that oscillations are sort of down towards the boundary in this carless on sense. So let's see uh, why this works. Um, Sarah, so we will actually, I mean, I'm going to do, I went very fast for that computation, but I'm going to do it again now in the honest case. So we will go a little bit slower through the same, but a little bit more generally. So this is Sarah essentially due to Kenneth Pfeiffer, but they didn't realize, um, you know, the full power of what they have done. Back in the day when they have done it, they were not tracing the test properly. So basically, the point is that if you take any matrix where gradient of the last row of the you know elements in this row, if you wish, on this one, I'm taking it symmetric. It doesn't actually have to be that matter. Actually, no, I'm not even taking it symmetric. Yeah. But anyway, gradient of the last row and uh, last column. <coughs> If they are Carlison, in the sense that gradient coefficient squared times t is Carlison. Again, remember your um, normalization is always such that t is sold against gradient. So what this is actually is t times gradient squared times the entity over t. So once again, you are integrating against one over t if you think about given the oscillations. So same story as always. It means that the matrix the coefficients have oscillations which are down towards the boundary at the rate which at least lets you integrate it against t over t. It's over and over the same. So, um, then you have this square function of conjunctural max estimate. And CN means Carlson. So once again, I repeat the way you should be thinking about this is t grad a squared, which is dimensionless quantity, the entity of T is a part of the measure. So the gradient is more and more well behaved as you go towards the boundary in this very mild sense that you have to integrate against. So let's see why this thing works. So we are doing the same computation as I just showed you, but somewhat more painfully and um, you know, tracing what we can and cannot do. So we start again with the square function in F2 square. It's still the same quantity as um, we used to have, gradient of UT, DFT. By elliptricity, I'm sticking an A. For now, I have done nothing interesting. And also by elliptricity, I'm sticking in the corner um, or one over the corner element. So remember that the matrix is elliptic, which means that everybody on diagonal is positive and bounded from below. Because otherwise we wouldn't have it with bounded um, eigenvalues. So I can divide, I mean, it's for sure not zero. It's for sure positive, it's for sure bounded from below. So A and N is this corner element. So this is your A and N. And you see why very soon. Point is I can do it now, but I'm just uh, what happens now? A better integration by parts? Yes, integration by parts. So I'm throwing this gradient, this one, on various parts of it. So there is a point when it hits this part. <laughs> I get d by grad u, which becomes zero because of the solution. So once it hits d by grad, so this is because d by grad u is zero. This is zero. 
There is another bit when this gradient hits one over a and n, which is the one you see here. The script is in here as u. Um, this is u. I apologize for handwriting. Uh, left from, you know, I, I throw a gradient on, but you still left to get it in. And there is a point when the gradient hits t, which is over here. So nothing interesting for now. Yeah, and I should mention that all the boundary terms are zero because t is zero on the boundary. So whatever is on the boundary is zero since t is zero. So you have to be protecting against t. Now, uh, what else happens? So zero is zero. I have got rid of, got rid of it. Uh, grad of one over a and n gives me one over a and n squared times grad of a and n. I just differentiate it. And grad of t uh, is one. Except that it's left with um, e n here. So grad of t is zero, 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 one. It's paired with a grad u. So all which is left from this is e n a grad u. E n being the value of that. Okay, so this gradient of t times this guy gave me one times e n a grad u because again it's a zero, 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 one. Okay, and now the um, slightly hidden but fun part comes is why these are Carlson measures. And remember this Carlson inequality, which I showed you last time, which says that the non tangential max pairs well with the Carlson measures, sort of by the reality arguments. And you would have to believe me that you can stick an L2 norms instead by the same duality arguments. It's, you know, silly like computation that you have to do it. But also to show, for example, the first integral, um, I'm just killing this one over a and x squared again by the PCT just bound from above. I'm left with red u, a is bounded, u, uh, gradient of a and n, t dx dt. And the basic point is by the work that produces a two, and Carlson inequality, which lets me pair Carlson measure with non tangential max, this is bounded by Carlson measure coefficients times square function times non tangential max function. So I started by square function and then to square. I ended up with what we wanted both times square function and then to without a square times non tangential max. And as you can guess, I'm going to hide this on the left and I'll get square function bounded by non tangential as far as this term goes. And basically the um, next term is, you know, more or less, so there is the, there is the term which comes from one over T and here you see why I have divided so carefully by A and N suddenly. <laughs> so remember that from uh, T you got integral in half space of E N A grad U times U one over A and N. And now there is this super delicate cancellation that was that's exactly there because I have you know out of the blue divided by a and n. Uh, you just see that you know this gives me the and the derivative in n direction times a and n, which is killed by this one. So this is just if I'm right in this thing, this is a sum of a and j u and so there is a dn part and there is all the other j's after n minus one so the dn part is exactly the one which used to be dt before is exactly the one which gives me u squared on the boundary again due to this magic cancellation with u and n and then there are the parts which carry tangential derivatives which are essentially handled the same as before i i won't exactly you know, go through the rest of the details, but basically you are doing the same thing. You are integrating by parts, you are getting the tangential derivatives in place. But long story short, there are sort of three important things that happen in the entire computation. I really encourage you to, uh, I'll try to send it nothing to look at it. If you haven't seen it, you know, it's, it's very pedagogical in a sense. I mean, it teaches you a lot of sense about what's possible and what's not in this. 
And the point is what you have used is the super delicate cancellation of, you know, division variant n, which is honestly an ingenious idea of any um, You have used the Paulus and measure of sorry, on your gradient of the coefficients. So this is exactly why we press. And the other ones, you will need the A and J's from that other bit with tangential derivatives, which was the end of the computation. And you have used the fact that gradient of T gives you one. So you have to be integrating again something whose gradient you are controlling. And this is again why, in principle, you cannot do it on, for example, rectifiable sets to start with. You know, you cannot actually directly go and say, I'm going to do the exact same integration by parts and use the serum I just showed you to prove infinity on all rectifiable cells because you don't have the T. You could, in principle, face some special direction, but you will not control its gradient as beautifully. So there is a lot of algebra in this, is what I'm trying to say. And part of the algebra is that A and N is very special, and you have to get to divide by it. And part of the algebra is that gradient is very special, and it just leaves you with one term. So it's a really hard space computation. The only thing you can do it is you can put it on the Lipschitz graph, same as before. In some sense, just making change of variables and preserving magically this property on the coefficients, but you cannot do it on more general mm -hmm. rectifiable sets. But in half space, that's the way you prove it for this Carlos and coefficients. Um, so, moral of the story uh, Carlos and measure conditional coefficients naturally appears by this duality with anti max. So, this is what the natural condition is. You have the super delicate cancellation of A and N over A and N, and that's what's in principle possible. And you have, you know, a very important role that T is T in the sense that you actually know the gradient of T. So precisely. If you try to do it directly, you know, like even if you try to do it in a Lipschitz domain without actually making a change of variables, you're gonna die. I mean it's it's in principle possible, but it's very, 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 very painful. I mean, even if you know where I go. And um, so once again, so the moral of the entire thing is that you can treat in both cases either by relic or by this. Uh, since by change of area, we say I apologize, it's not super crispy, but you don't really need it. Uh, the point is that for everything we could do in this change of area is preserving the independence. Uh, for Kenny Piper, uh, story you would be doing a slightly different change of variables, sort of averaging on Whitney Hughes with the Poisson kernel, which gives you this kind of some kind of coefficients and also lets you integrate by parts. But either way, you are doing some change of variables and preserve the uh, corresponding condition of coefficients, and you can do it. Um, Okay, so T independence is this um, very strange structural condition which only makes sense for a few um, contexts and you can see already that, you know, it cannot possibly be necessary because it's sort of, you know, even on the Lipschitz domain, like who is T, you know, in principle is a direction upwards, but it's obvious and not optimal. Uh, the DKT coefficients, the ones which were referred to, the ones you saw just now, uh, the ones that is find the Carlson measure condition, are on the other hand sort of optimal. So it's not true that you have, for example, A infinity. If I, so remember, by the way, that this gives you A infinity by the serum I just showed you, because you control square functions, hence you control harmonic measure. Um, the T independence cannot be an optimal, it's just meaningless in most contexts. But the uh, that of Kenny Piper coefficient condition is sort of optimal. So, what do I mean by sort of? I will show you in a second. There are counter examples going back to preferred type scanning and simultaneous modica morphola. And actually, the one thing that I'm going to show you about them is. Um, 
from uh, Bruno Poggio's note on archive. I don't know if he has submitted it anywhere or not. I made him do it at some point. But I think that it was a very good exercise showing you that the counter examples are actually borderline in both directions. So they, um, there is something important about this different data. So here is the thing. You take this um, Carlson condition, which is, you know, ignore the soups, the details. I mean, if you don't know about this, just take it as a condition of gradient of a square. So you take this boundary condition. You take this condition of the coefficients. And the point is that uh, both things can happen. So if you break the condition, you can have harmonic measure, which is not absolutely continuous. So hence, this is as good as it gets. But if you break the condition, you can also get the boundary, the harmonic measure, which is absolutely continuous. So this is a little bit, you know, in one sense, it's optimal in the sense that the moment you are breaking it, you get counterexamples. On the other hand, it's kind of borderline in the sense that you could be breaking it, but not get counterexamples. So it's a little bit of a, um, it basically tells you that you cannot really make an if and only if statement in this world. You cannot say that you have a infinity if and only if that Bertanic Piper condition holds. But it's true that the moment you break it, you are screwed. You cannot generally put it in the bigger generality of coefficients. Um, and at least one direction is basically there. So yeah, you, you can say that, you know, so you can build the sequence and you can imagine how you are doing this. So you can build the sequence of matrices, which are elliptic and whatever else you want about them, which converge pointwise uniformly to another elliptic matrix, which uh, consecutively kill the Gerkenic Piper condition of the coefficients, meaning that it gets the corresponding Carlson mode to infinity. And the limit gives you the harmonic measure, which is singular with respect to sigma. Yet again, you can also build a sequence which will consecutively kill the Albertine Piper condition, which will not give you the counter example. So that the harmonic measure is actually still So both are possible, but in terms of the, um, since there exists a counter example, you can say that you cannot get worse than that. So in that sense, it's optimal. This is as bad as it gets. So, I mean, as I will show you towards the end of the lecture, so in the very last lecture, you can ask smarter questions or slightly different questions, in which case you can get slightly different conditions. But as far as the infinity goes, this is sort of optimal. Um, so this is, yeah, the point I'm trying to make. There is no quantifiable equivalent between DKP. Yet morally, she is as good as it gets. You get counterexamples behind it, beyond this. And for other kind of estimates for green functions and CME estimates and solutions, you can do slightly better, but we'll get to this later. Morally, this is sort of as good as it gets. Okay, and there are some elements of the construction. Um, I'm not going to give you them, but um, <coughs> What do I want to retain? Um, you got, so this is going back to Modico Motola. And the point is, you know, you're basically building crazy oscillations. I mean, the way you're killing this um, absolute continuity of harmonic measure coming from the matrix is remember, you're, you're trying to produce something where the gradient of the coefficients would not actually be um, controlled, covering some control towards the boundary. And what you do is, you know, it doesn't have to be not smooth in terms of the, like you would think that, you know, this is qualitative that you are breaking smoothness of the gradient. Not really. I mean, you are doing it quantitatively. You know, you're taking cosine, cosines and you're making smaller and smaller strips where your coefficients oscillate more and more. And in a sense, you are getting your Brownian traveler slows. So if you think in terms of the material, in terms of electrostatics, What's actually happening is that, you know, it's as though you're building a mountain landscape in some sense. You know, even if your boundary is straight, if you introduce the material, which is like really, really, really crazy, 
and your uh, Brownian travelers have to, you know, go up and down the mountains, they're going to get lost when going to the boundary. It's much harder to get them lost this way than a Lamborghini with their tractor boundary, but it's still possible. So it's basically the, you know, A gives you, you know, the oscillations of A give you sort of, they, they make your Brownian travelers tired and boss in the, you know, bumping around the material as they get the boundary. So in some sense, that's what you are trying sort of to preserve by this partisan condition of the gradient. You are trying to make sure that your material is at least somewhat flat, somewhat coming down, somewhat uniform more and more as you're going to the boundary. If it's not, if you get more and more mountains, nothing is going to help you. Morally, that's what's happening. Okay, and with that, um, let's talk a bit, so this is not lecture six, don't believe your eyes. Sorry. What about the, the other case? How do you build the, the ones that break the candy, double candy fiber that still converges to? You are trying to align them a little bit because it's a question of T derivatives, right? Mm -hmm. So you are trying to align them tiny. So if you still oscillate, but you sort of align oscillations correctly so that they still have a way to go straight, mm -hmm. you can. So it's sort of a question of alignment. You know, if you have your um, cosine like this, and then the next one and the layer next to it switches to screw up your face, they will get lost. If your cosine becomes more oscillatory, but you have pass towards the boundary, they still have enough room to go. Make sense? Kind of that way. But cosines, you know, like more and more oscillating cosines are going to screw up in anyway. So that's the deal. Uh, I still have five minutes, beautiful. So we'll discuss, you know, what what doesn't work and what works, and then we'll, you know, we'll actually switch to the more serious, the hard for dimensional case next time. But let's discuss, you know, what are the problems. So now we are in, uh, let's say, R n minus gamma. You know, case of lower dimensional boundary. Let's say even Richards one. Let's say even relatively flat. So once again, we are looking at. I'm afraid to touch anything here, but that kind of sense. So the chord, which is deep shots and even relatively flat, but in n dimensional space, and you're asking yourself what you can do. Uh, Elliptic theory works, life is good, you have accelerated your Brownian travelers, um, and uh, we have decided that this is the correct power already a couple of lectures ago. So it seems that, remember that what we have decided is that uh, the Good operators, suppose, you know, like all of the ones with elliptic matrix here are good from the point of view of the basic elliptic area. So you would think that substituting A by identity, which typically gives you Laplacian, is a good idea. Except that, well, this time you are preserving one of the distance. Turns out it's actually not a good idea because Euclidean distance is super rough. For these considerations, that this one with the Euclidean distance is actually going to kill you. But this is something you realize literally, and this is, you know, probably serious. I and mean, you've seen me, many of you have seen me presenting this material, but since I never had a chance to go into proof, I never got to tell you how it was actually born. It's really, really, you know, it was a really dance between, well, it was uh, joined well with Guy and then Giuseppe's joined on as well. And it was really a dance of that integration by parts that I just showed you. And a conversation with Guy on what could be done about the change of variables. So long story short, because of all the constraints that I showed you before, uh, straight up, you know, so again, you go to us less than n estimates. Um, again, you know, really doesn't work because T independence is not relevant. So you have to be proven that square function and tangential max estimates, and you want to work with this condition somehow for which you can find the analog. The problem is that um, it, it doesn't work for like structural reasons. So first of all, recall this division by A and X. 
this was a very special thing that was one, you know, that, that's one corner in your matrix. If you have identity in this corner or a function times identity, I mean, point is there are many T's. So what used to be just one T and respectively the corner coefficient, which was, you know, so magically canceling when you got your T, doesn't exist anymore because there is not one corner coefficient. There are many of them. And basically, you are killing isometry that somehow when you are doing, you know, any mock-up of this Kenny-Carter integration by parts, since you cannot divide by A and N, since there is no A and N, there are like, you know, there is an entire diagonal of A and N, there are many T's in your conversation. You cannot do anything about it. You need either identity here or something very close to identity. This is not, so remember that you are trying to treat Lipschitz graph. So this coefficient is not your personal choice. It's whatever came from the change of variables. You cannot say, okay, I'm going to work with the matrix to which this is identity. Good for you, but this is not what will treat Lipschitz graphs, even. With a small Lipschitz constant, even. Because this and this and this are exactly what's coming from change of variables. So you are doing the scanning part of change of variables. You realize that this coefficient is all too bad and all too disturbed to do the same integration by parts because yet again, you have nobody to divide by, you know, and this role of T is, is sort of screwed up. And so you keep going back and forth between one person integration by parts and another person trying to do that change of variables, which actually can get there. And it's an infinite conversation of, you know, sort of, okay, and if we change variables slightly different, then they get, you know, coefficients which are actually close in that sense, can you integrate by parts? No. You, I, I have the stone which you test, you know, and then again, so I, I need to combat the stone. Can you make me change variables which will actually do that? No, <laughs> but I can adjust. So there is an infinite, I mean, you can get who is who in this conversation, <laughs> I guess. But it really was a very long term. And uh, while we were, you know, dancing between what actually can be done with integration by parts and what the change of variables brings. And remember that you also have the scores of distance to the boundary to combat because, you know, your coefficients are much worse than they used to be. Um, and long story short, I mean, eventually you manage, but you also realize that you have to change the question, meaning that that's when you realize that one of Euclidean distance will be killing you no matter what you do. Because again, remember the gradient is going to fall on the coefficients. I mean, this is sort of it already does in dimension n minus one. The gradient will fall on the coefficients. The gradient of Euclidean distance is a horrible thing. There is nothing that will say you from know, the gradient of the gradient distance. So you realize both that you know you need a very different change of variables <laughs> and you need a very different distance. Well, what about working with core on your lab? And like decomposing the, the space according to like layers. Um you mean that on the weekly fields and stuff, it's still not smooth enough. I mean, like you you can do something which is sort of formally smooth, but this is all quantitative. So you need to be able to sum up, you know, I mean, since this is all combined with estimates, just smoothing sort of formally is not doing it. Like, in integration by parts, this is, like before you integration by parts, this, you score it upon the line then. You still have a T there, I mean, like you have powers of distance there and they're still, they're still bad for you somehow. Um, so this is the, I know I'm almost out of time, but I'll show you last thing that actually worked. So long story short, what works is, well, first of all, again, you can work with the matrix in which there is this corner element, but uh, all this corner, corner elements are partisan. You can on top of it work with a matrix like that. So this is my A1. Plus a small addition, which is Carlson by itself. 
So this is T grad A control. This is the other thing, which is A divided by T control. And both are fine. So notice that again, here the normalization is such that T grad of a matrix is controlled. Here, the normalization is such that uh, matrix itself is controlled. And I'm saying I can do that, I can do this, and I can put the sum of the two. And all of this is going to be important because of our change of variables. And we have to introduce a different value for change of variables. And we need a difference then on the distance here. We need a certain, you know, carriers and measures after the change of variables of this distance to be controlled, which is going a little bit to what you have been asking. I mean, you, there is nothing with Euclidean distance which will make the same close to one. So long story short, we need to change everything in this conversation. We need a different change of variables, which makes it closer to isometry. In some sense, we need, so coming back to the analogy with Brownian travelers, what we need to avoid is then being lost getting in the circles around your set. So before you needed to make sure that Brownian travelers would not get lost, you know, going towards your set and roughly speaking a normal direction. Now you have 55 normal directions and you need to make sure that they will not get lost in neither of them, but on top of it, you need to make sure that they won't get lost sort of circling around them. You need to guide them in the right direction and not just, you know, if you just open a passage, it, they still might sort of circle around. Right? <coughs> so you need to avoid that. And uh, that's in part why you're introducing a different distance and so on. And what's amazing about this is that already in the case of the small Richards graph, you sort of use everything humanly known about rectifiable sets. The truth is that you don't do a small, like in the case of code dimension one, this um, integration by parts that I showed you, it, you know, it only uses integration by parts, it only uses half space and then, you know, change of variables into Richards graph. There is nothing else you need to know in principle. Here, you know, in the end of the day, the way this change of variables is constructed literally by hands is knowing everything that he knew about rectifiable sets and he knows a lot about rectifiable sets. So it's sort of already at that level, you really need this approximating planes and you really need a coefficient which sort of guides you from scale to scale to approximating planes. And so you are really building a change of variables which changes from scale to scale. And we changes in a way that keeps you orthogonal to this approximating plane from the better numbers. You know, I know I have confused everyone when speaking about better numbers, but again, remember that the rectifiable set and Lipschitz domain in particular is the one in which you have approximate tangents at all scales. And the tangents change depending on x and the scale, but they are there. So this change of variables knows about all of this, already in the case of Lipschitz graph. And no, you are not doing something blind saying that this is the T direction and there is one T direction and they do everything uniformly in T direction, which is both what Kenny Pfeiffer and Rennick do. It's something which is actually different for every scale and every distance. I mean, you readjust yourself to respect the direction in which you are going. So over and over again, you, um, I, I'll, I'll start from this, I promise I'll finish now and I'll start from this next time. But the point is over and over and over again, you have to readjust yourself, you have to readjust your Brownian travelers to show them the direction towards the approximating plane of your graph. Even if you are on a small Richard's graph, it, it's absolutely amazing to which extent it's actually delicate in the hard dimensional setting. Your T is still not helping you, even though you, your graph is very flat. You really have to sort of remind Brownian travelers where is the landing strip every single time. And we'll start from this next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so with this uh, in integration by parts argument, do you, and like the Carlson measure estimate on the gradient of the coefficients, 
Can you use the estimate on the whole matrix or just those that last column in row? So if you do it, uh, actually, this, this is one of the things that I think in five I didn't notice. And at some point, you know, when I was suffering through this, I did, but again, it's still that argument. Uh, you only use the part which is in the column than in the row. And that agrees amazingly because when you do the transformation from Lipschitz domain, if you think about what part of the matrix it affects, it also only affects the last column and the last row. Just that's what change of variables does. So you only use it there. The truth is that once you get the rectifiable sets and similar ones, you are going to mess this up anyway because you will have to, you know, turn every single line and things like this. But the integration by parts itself only uses the last column and the last row, and it doesn't even need the gradient and all of that. It needs some because remember there is you know sort of just integration by parts, so there is a certain form kind of. So it's actually divergence of the last row which needs to be Carlson controlled. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't even remember, it's not both. It's like either last row or last column that you need divergence Carlson control. Whatever. Yeah. Falls on C by integration by parts. Maybe this is too long to answer, but do you know if Bruno's example is like a counter example to like the gradient on the whole matrix, or does he do this on like one column? Good question. Uh, well, it's a, it's a two dimensional example, right? <laughs> so, I mean, probably just that, but also, you know, you have like one point otherwise. And it's not, so it's the same example as Modicon Mortal, I mean, like you just did it more systematically and actually controlled it. It's the same example. And uh, there's this comment, so it depends on, you know, like who is presenting. To me, it's natural because of the science and cosines and messing up the material the way I presented it. Guy has mentioned it yesterday, and the way he views it and the way it was originally approved is by um, um, conformal methods, as a matter of fact. So it has to do with what I have been repeatedly mentioning that you could, in principle, create the measure on the boundary, which is not absolutely continuous with respect to sigma to start with by these products. And then if you think about that measure and you know that that's a messy one because it's not absolutely continuous to sigma, you can use conformal methods and build a matrix which is now on the half space, which comes from this measure, which will give you harmonic measure, which is not absolutely continuous with respect to sigma. So that's actually how it came to life to start with. You start with something which you know is not absolutely continuous measure, which has nothing to do with harmonic functions, but then by conformal methods, you make it into a matrix. So it's sort of like, like that, and people think about it, like probably, you know, John Gagnett would think about it this way. And I mean, definitely it was born this way and he's thinking about it this way. To me, I mean, not knowing the example, I mean, I would probably try to build the situations by hands, but just because of this physics and fiction of creating a material which oscillates more and more. I might not have ever arrived if I didn't know how, but to me, that seems natural in other ways as well. Any other questions? Oh, okay.